So, of course, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5 is one of the better known passages, one of the better known stories in the Old Testament of Naaman the Syrian and uh, him being healed of his leprosy. And we're going to get into, in, into 2 Kings chapter 5, but if you would, just very quickly turn over to 2 Kings chapter 4, just one chapter back, and we'll, we'll, start, the, we'll start the message there in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse 8, the Bible reads, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, and there was a great woman, and, that, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. But let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set him there a bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us, that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned into the chamber, and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Call the Shunite. When he had called her, she stood before him, and he said unto her, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for all this care. What is to be done for thee? And the subject of the, of the sermon this morning is specifically the character of Gehazi. And I turn us back to 2 Kings chapter, uh, 2 Kings chapter 4 because I want to see some of the things about Gehazi. We're all very familiar with what happens to Gehazi, how, how it ends with him there, where he gets the leprosy and becomes white as snow for the sin that he sinned. But back in chapter 4, we learn a little bit more about Gehazi, who he was. We see, first of all, that Gehazi had a position. He had a very important position. He was positioned as the servant to the man of God, as it says there in verse 12. And he said to Gehazi, his servant. So we see that Gehazi is the servant of Elisha, the man of God. And he also served as his messenger. That was part of the, the role, the capacity of that role that he had as the servant of the man of God was to be his messenger. That's why he says to his Gehazi, call this the Shumanite. And when he called her, he stood before her, and he said unto him, Say now unto her. So he's using Gehazi as a kind of a go-between between himself and this Shumanite woman. So we see that Gehazi had some responsibility, that he had a very important role uh, in the Scriptures as the, the servant of the man of God. He was kind of, as we might say today, he was in the know. You know, everything, he was close to the man of God. He would have not known what the man of God perhaps was planning more than others were. He would, would have known the communications that take, had taken place. He would have had, you know, uh, his finger on the pulse of the man of God more so than others that Elisha might have been associated with. You know, Gehazi, Gehazi was very close. As it said in 2 Kings chapter 5, we notice when, when uh, Naaman, come, the Syrian, comes to be healed, it says that, that, uh, that he sent a servant unto him. And then later in that same passage, it says that he sent Gehazi, that it talks about Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, making a distinction between just a servant and Gehazi, the servant of Elisha. So we see that Gehazi was an important person, that he was given important jobs on behalf of the man of God. And Gehazi was also, if we notice here, uh, he was witness to the miracles of the man of God. If we were to continue to read on here, we would see the great miracle that takes place for this woman where she is, uh, she's given a child, and we're gonna, we'll come back to it later, and then later that child dies, and then, of course, Jesus, or not Jesus, but uh, Elisha comes back and heals that child and raises him back to life. It's one of the great miracles in the Old Testament. And Gehazi was a first-hand witness to that. I mean, he was there in the house when it happened, when Elisha opened the door and came out and, and said, call the woman, and, and they were reunited. she was reunited with her, her son who had died. So we see that Gehazi was a very important person. And it's my opinion, you know, this is strictly an opinion, I, I don't have any scripture to back this up, but if we look at the pattern of, in Scripture, and we consider who Ge Gehazi was and the and the the role that he was had in, in Scripture as the man, the servant of the man of God, it's likely that Ge Gehazi was going to precede Elijah. That's my belief. That if if he had not fallen into the sin, that Gehazi would have become the next great prophet in Israel. Now I might be wrong about that. I'm open to correction on that, but that's my belief is that Gehazi would have followed him because we see that often, you know, Elisha himself was a servant to Elijah, and then himself became the prophet of the man of God. We see the same thing happening with Joshua, how he preceded Moses, but prior to that, he was the servant of Moses. So we see that being a servant of the man of God is a very important position. It's often, in the scripture, we see that it's somebody who's being groomed, or somebody who's being trained, it's their protege, so to speak, or somebody that's being brought up under the man of God, so that they, one day, can also go on and be the great man of God. Now, get, now, the problem with Gehazi here, of course, we know the story ends very badly for him. And the problem with Gehazi is that he lost sight of what mattered most. And that's what happened to Gehazi, and that's why he ended up in the position that he was in, having leprosy. And we saw that in 2 Kings chapter 5, that when he saw a name in the Syrian come, and 
and offer that all that abundance of wealth, all the changes of raiment and the silver. And we saw the man of God, Elisha, refuse it. And then he, he became covetous in his heart. And he began to lose sight of what mattered most. And we wonder why. How is it that Gehazi had that great fall? What is it that, why did he have that lapse in faith? Why did he, why did he covet after that thing? Why did he want those riches that, that name and the Syrian had to offer? And I, I think maybe it was that he just lacked a faith in God's provision. You know, maybe Gehazi had been you know, following Elisha around and he made some sacrifices in his life. You know, he wasn't out, you know, provide, you know, learning a trade or anything like that or, or, or finding a way to provide for his home other than, you know, the provision that came in through the man of God. And maybe he had lacked faith in God's provision. And maybe when he saw that silver and that, those changes of raiment, he said, hey, here's my opportunity to get a little stash and put something aside for a rainy day. You know, I think that's kind of maybe what his thinking was. And that's probably why he came and, and took that stuff and took it to the tower. And it says that he hid it. And it says he went and bestowed those goods in his home. So, you know, why is it that he, he had hid that stuff? Why did he not run off and spend it? Why did he say, man, I've I got it. You know, run over to, you know, Reno or Las Vegas or something and, and try to strike it rich. You know, why didn't he immediately just go out and, and go off the rails and forsake the man of God and go out and, you know, live riotously or whatever? He, there must have been some reason why he was motivated to take that stuff, but I don't, from Naaman, but I don't think the reason why he took that was so that he could just go out and live a sinful life or that he could go out and just enjoy the pleasures of sin. I think that maybe the Gehazi had started to experience a lapse in faith and maybe despite all of the great things he got to see, all the great preaching he probably got to hear, all the one-on-one -on -one maybe counsel he had with Elisha, that he started to lack faith in God's provision and he started to covet after that thing. And when he saw an opportunity to maybe, like I said, have that, that rainy day fund set aside, he coveted and went after it. And really the lesson, right, you know, on that, the surface lesson on that is that, you know, we can't justify covetousness. There's no way to justify it. You know, obviously if, if a person's being covetous so that they can go out and live a sinful life, that's, that's very obviously wicked. But a lot of times, you know, we, we try to hide behind this veil of financial responsibility. You know, I'm, well, I'm curing all this wealth and I'm paying off all this debt and I'm putting away all this money, not because I'm greedy or covetous, but because I'm very financially responsible. And, you know, I'm all for financial responsibility. I think that's a good idea. I think it's good to have some, some money set aside. I think it's great if you can operate outside of, out of debt in a debt-based economy. I mean, that's how our whole system works is on debt. But if you, can, if you can manage and live your life in a way where you live debt-free or mostly debt-free, that's great. But we should not allow those things to become a veil of, you know, I'm being financially responsible, there it's okay, therefore it's okay for me to put the riches and the, and the wealth ahead of the things of God. And I think that's what Gehazi kind of fell into. He fell into saying, you know, I need some security here. And he lost sight of what mattered. He lost sight of the fact that God can provide all those things that he needed. And that he could take care of them even in his latter days. That as he became an old man, he would have, taken, he would have found a way to take care of Gehazi. And I think a lot of Christians today, we fall into that. We start to worry about, you know, our finances a little too much. We start to worry about, you know, how we're going to provide for this or that in the future. Or how our retirement fund, that's like the big one. Everyone's got to have a retirement fund. You know, that retirement fund's kind of a newer concept. It wasn't something that people have always had. And we've made it through many, 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 many thousands of years of human history without retirement funds. And people have served God, you know, throughout all, all of time without a retirement fund. But when we start to say, oh, I've got to have my retirement fund. I've got to have name in the Syrian silver stashed away. I've got to bestow that in a house somewhere so that I can, when I get older, you know, I have something I can fall back on. When we start to say, that's more important to me than being faithful to God, then we're going to start to have a problem. That's when we're going to start to see us maybe drop, pull back on the soul winning. You know, I can't go soul winning today because I've got to get those hours in at work. You know, or I, or I can't be in church in this service because... You know, I got I got to get this business built, or I've got to get I've got to be at work. I've got to earn this money, and we start to put off the things of God so that we can bestow some things in the house for later. We try to hide these things from God and say, "Well, this is just me." And we do it all under the veil of financial responsibility, through being a good steward. And again, it's great to be a good steward. It's great if you can do that. I'm just saying, you don't have to do one or the other. You can do both. You don't have to pull a Gehazi and go and, and take, you know, the un, and take those things which, you know, the man of God refused and have that lapse in faith. You can serve God. You can keep your focus right, and maybe you won't get there as quick 
to, to achieving your financial goals, or maybe maybe you need to just stop and and, and re and reevaluate what are your goals. You know, what are your priorities in life? Is it more important for you to live debt free than to be a soul winner? You know, if if me saying, well, I've got to be debt free by by a certain date, and that means, well, I, I just don't have the time to go out and, and do my soul winning. Or, you know, I've got to work so many hours now that I, I just don't have time to read my Bible. Or I've got to do so much I don't have time to pray or be in church or spend time with my family and raising my children, the nurture and the admonition of God. If those are our priorities, then, you know, we're pulling a Gehazi. And that's not what we want. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do any of those things or that it's sinful to have some money stashed away. I think that's, that's a good thing. But I don't think we have to have all these riches. We don't have to have, you know, a year's worth of income stowed away. That's a lapse in God's provision to take care of you. And really, the question that Gehazi is asked there in 2 Kings chapter 5, the beginning of verse 25, it says, But he went in and stood before his master. So after he takes the, the silver that he bestows in the house, he goes back into Elijah and just acts like everything's normal. Nothing's changed. And Elijah said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, thy servant went nowhere there. So he's trying to hide it. He's trying to say, you know, hey, I didn't, I didn't go anywhere. I've been here the whole time. What are you talking about? And he said unto him, when not mine heart with thee, when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? And then he asked him this, this question. Is it a time to receive? And that's the question that I want to ask us this morning. And that's the title of this sermon. Is it a time to receive? See, Elijah's asking them a very pointed question. And, I, and you know what? I think Elisha asked that because he understood the times that he lived in. Elisha had an understanding of the times that we lived in. And if we were to take you know, this portion of Scripture in the context of, 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 this, uh, of the book of uh, 2 Kings and elsewhere, we would see that you know, the, the nation of Israel was very backslidden. That the nation of Israel was very wicked. And that they were in a very sad state spiritually. And Elisha understood that. And I believe that's why he asked this question. He said, is it a time to receive? Now, you could think of another time where perhaps that would have been the, the question that the answer to that question would be yes, it is a time to receive. We think of King Solomon, you know, when he and when King David, when Israel was doing right, when they were following the Lord, when they had a righteous king reigning over them, and he was doing following the commandments of the Lord as God and doing the will of God, and God blessed them. And Solomon was able to receive all those riches. He and the kings of the earth came and brought all, their, all their, their gold and their vestures and their raiment and all of these gifts to him. And he was able to receive. That was the time to receive when things were going well, when things were right. But Elijah here asked this question because he understood that he was living in a time when there was more important things to do than just trying to receive. As he says there, money and garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen. His a nation was ungodly and wicked. And we live in a similar time as that. We are living in a time, we're living in a nation that is ungodly and wicked. And if you can't see that, then you need to come back again and again and start to hear some preaching of the Word of God. Because I don't have time to go through all the proofs of our nation being as ungodly and as wicked it is. I mean, you need to open your eyes and look around. If you can't see it, it's because you're brainwashed. Because you've been watching too much television and listening to too much of the media. If you can't see and you don't know the Word of God, if you cannot understand and look around and see that we are living in a wicked and evil and adulterous generation. And Elisha understood this. And that's why he asked this question. Is it a time to receive? And so because we also are living in such a time as Elisha did. An ungodly and unholy nation. In the midst of a, of a, a wicked and adulterous people. That we need to ask ourselves this question. Is it a time for us to receive? Is that the priority in our life? To have the house to have the second car, to have the bank account taken care of, to have all the debt paid off, to have all these things lined up. Is that our priority in life? Is that what we need? And that's, the answer is no. But the thing is, many, many Christians seem to think, think so. And you can tell by their lifestyle, by the things that they do and how they spend their time. And what they do is they allow the riches of this world to rob them of the riches in heaven. You know, we are, we're living in a time when we need people to, to make sacrifices. When we need people to rise up and live for God and, and, and not make the priority in their life, you know, the vacation. Not make the priority in their life the two-car garage and the basement. Now, it's, there's nothing wrong with those things. And if we can afford those things and have time, great. 
you know, if God can bless us with those things and we can enjoy those things, they are not in and of themselves sinful. But what the point I'm trying to make is, is that our priority in life, to receive those things, to receive the homes and the olive yards and the riches, and to have all these things stored up. Because when we make that our focus, we make earthly treasure, and if you would turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6, when we make earthly treasure our priority in life, it ends up robbing us of the true treasures which are in heaven. When we make storing up and, and having financial stability and making sure that all our finances and all our ducks in a row financially, that we make that the priority in our life, then we're going to rob ourselves of some true riches. As you're turning to 1 Timothy 6, let me just get, read you uh, several scriptures here that warn us about being greedy, that warn us about desiring riches. 1 Timothy 3 says, not given to the, this is the qualifications, of course, for the bishop, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre. So a, a pastor, a man who desires the office of a bishop, needs to understand and determine in his heart before he ever enters into that position that he's not going into it for what he can gain, for what he can get out of it, financially especially, what he can get out of it financially. That would be go after filthy lucre. Because if you're going into the position of a pastor desiring you know, what you can get out of it, a comfortable living to make you know have have a nice bank account. You're going to start preaching things that you ought not. You're going to turn aside out of the way after vain jangling. You're going to start preaching things for filthy lucre's sake, and you're going to preach false doctrine and heresy, and you're going to harm people that have come to you to hear the word of God preached because you're more concerned with your pocketbook and then the than the welfare of, of the of the people under your ministry under your preaching. You're going to compromise. You know, and I just. Just thinking here, and that's why I'm so grateful for the for the example of our pastor. You know, I was thinking about this. I've known several pastors throughout the years, and you know, we have a pastor here at Faithful Word that is has made has not made you know the, the wealth of this world and the comfortable of the living of this world you know his priority. When you're talking about a man that has his tenth child away and is living in a two bedroom house, you know, he, he's making do. And what and I believe part of the reason he's done it is to set an example for those that would come after him. I know that if one day if I am able to go out and start a church somewhere, you know, me and my wife to talk about it, it's not I'm not looking to move into some nice suburbanite neighborhood where I can have the three-story house and the full basement and the two-car garage. That's not the priority. You know, I want to live as a as a as a meager of a means as I can, so therefore the, the, the expenses the, the, the keep my expenses low so that we there's more to do in the work of God. And I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but I, I just believe, you know, that's part of the reason why we should, as those that desire the office of bishop, should not be greedy and filthy lucre. It says in 1 Timothy 3, Likewise, must the deacons be grave, not double tongue, not given to much wine, not greedy and filthy lucre. Then, again, the same warning. Titus 1, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self willed not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. 1 Peter 5, 2, when he was speaking to the elders that were among them, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. He said, you know, if you're going to be a feed the flock of God, you need to make sure you don't do it by constraint, but you need to make sure you want something that you want to do. It's something you're willing to do. And not for the for filthy lucre state, not saying, well, you know, I need a new career, something that might pay me well. Let me go into the pastor and see if I can, you know, glean the riches of this world. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, one who is ready to preach the whole counsel of God. You're there in 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us there be therewith content. We ought to be content with food and raiment. That's the, that's the scripture. That's the plain teaching of the Bible. That we shouldn't desire to, you know, uh, have this great gain, that, that we should be content and have godliness. Then we can under, begin to understand you know, what it means to, have, to have, be truly happy. When we begin to value and appreciate the things that we do have, the good things that we do have, our family, our health, our ability to go out and serve God and see great things done to the glory of, the, uh, of God and His kingdom. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I was told recently by somebody that, you know, your wife's going to have to stop having kids someday. Just can't afford them. And I was, I've even been told in the past by a Baptist preacher that I should only have as many kids as I can afford. That's a wicked philosophy, friend. That's a Ge Gehazi type of philosophy. That's somebody who lacks faith in God's provision. And they can pontificate, and they can talk about how they're blue in the face, about how they pray, and all the, how wonderful God just 
answers all their prayers and everything. But when you're telling somebody in your congregation that you should only have as many children as, as you can afford, my friend, you're, you're, you're sowing the seeds of doubt in somebody's heart. You're saying, you're telling that person, you know, God can't take care of you like you think he, like he says he can. God is, is, you know, God can take care of us. God will provide all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And he commands us to be fruitful and multiply. And the Bible says that the, you know, the, the, the fruit of the womb is his reward. So we should learn to be content with the things that we have and not to be desiring of great gain. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9, that they that will be rich. Now notice it says will be. Not, not, you know, we don't want to just write off everybody that has wealth as just wicked and evil. Now it's true that the wick, most wicked and evil people are very wealthy people in this world. But you can be plenty wicked as a poor man. But they that will be rich, meaning those that have made, like a Gehazi, they've made the riches of this world their focus. They will be rich. They're not rich, but man, they want to get rich. And that's what they're, that's what they're striving after, to be rich. But they that will be rich fall into a temptation and a snare. You can get into a lot more sin once you start to have that money coming in. Once you start to being able, hey man, I, I've been working really hard for a long time and, and now this thing is really starting to pay off and now I can kind of sit back and take my knees. You know, I can build bigger barns so that I can store even more of my, my substance as the parable goes. And then we have that idle time. Then we're not as busy. And, and then we can... And, and a lot of times people say, well, I'm just going to work really hard now where I can take it easy and then I'll start serving God. But what you don't understand is that when those riches come in and life starts to get a little easier, and there's that nice cushion, there's that pad in the bank account, and, and the, now all those things start to, all those toys start to, they have that extra little shine to them. All those little hobbies you've always wanted to do, those things start to take over. And if we're not careful, we can fall into a temptation to snare, as it says there in verse 9, and to many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money itself. You see, money can be a very useful tool. A person can use money to accomplish great things for God. And I believe that Faithful Word Baptist Church is a great example of that. A church that has kept its expenses very low. Oh, you mean in a strip mall. That's the knock on, on us, right? Well, yeah, we mean a strip mall with about 300 people on a Sunday morning. And we go out and we send people all across the world and we send out you know, uh, DVDs and preaching CDs and MP3s all across the world and we'll be able to go out and do so many marathons and do great things and all those things are financed. All those things require money. So money itself is not evil. It's the love of money. When just a having money is what you want. It is the root of all evil. While some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Don't be a Gehazi. Don't go after him. When you see the riches over there, when you see Naaman and the Syrian trotting away with his servants and his raiment and his silver, don't go running after it. The Bible says you need to go in the opposite direction. You need to flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art also called and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Turn over first. You go and just look down verse uh, verse 17. Charge them that are rich. So there's even a charge to those that already have riches in this world. Charge them that are rich that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches. And that's a very that's a very telling trait of somebody that has riches. I can tell you in my line of work that I've I've been around a lot of people that have, have they've got money, and I go into their homes and people. I mean, it's just amazing. People live in and what and the average home in like Chandler in Tempe, in parts of Gilbert. I mean, the average home down there would have been just like a king's mansion back in the day. I mean, it was just luxurious, pools, high ceilings, tiles, just thousands of square feet. And then, you know, you know they got the two people living there and the, and the kid in college. And they're very high-minded. And they trust in uncertain riches. And they, they can be very condescending. Some of the most just condescending people I've ever met have been wealthy people. <coughs> But also, you know, that's not to say that we should write them all off because I've, I've met very kind and nice people that are very down to earth. But it's just something about when you have the riches of this world, you know, if you've worked very hard to amass this wealth, you know, you can kind of get this attitude, well, I'm just better than everybody else. That's why all these other people are poor. You know, there's a lot of very humble men of God, I believe, that if they wanted to go out into the, into the business world, could become millionaires. If they put the same amount of energy 
and, uh, and dedication into some private businesses they do into their serving the word of uh, the, uh, serving God, they would become very wealthy people. So rich people or people that have the riches of this world ought to be, be careful not to just think that everybody who isn't as they are, you know, that they're somehow less than them. They're not to be high-minded nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. But they that but that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. They should use those riches that they have, that wealth, as it says they're ready to communicate, rich in good works, ready to distribute, ready to give of those riches, those that God has given. It's God that gives you the strength to get wealth. And it may be that God puts individuals in a position to, to, to gain wealth and gives them strength and ability and wisdom to gain wealth for the sole purpose that they might turn around and use it to the glory and honor of God to accomplish His work. That they may lay hold on eternal life. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. The Bible talks a lot about riches. The Bible talks a lot about uh, the danger of, of falling into covetousness. The Bible, you're turning over to Matthew 6, I'll read to you from Proverbs 11. He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. You know, he that trusts in his riches or thinks, you know, because one, you know, it makes me think of the Catholic Church. You know, people that are trusting in their riches. Well, it's got to be true. Or I mean, look at this just cathedral. Look at Vatican City. Look at all the wealth. Look at the, the throne of gold. Look at all the garments. Look at all the, just the pomp and all the, all the beautiful buildings that they have. Obviously, this is the true church. They, they're so blessed by God. They're trusting those riches. And guess what? They're going to fall one day. They're going to fall right into the pit of hell because they're trusting in their works. The Bible says that the righteous shall flourish as a branch. And the one who trusts in Christ as Savior, and not in his, own, in his own self, but just believes on Him that justifieth the ungodly, you know, when He comes into the kingdom with Jesus Christ and sits down with Him, He's going to flourish. You know, and He's going to see those true riches. Proverbs 22, a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches. Isn't that, isn't that I mean, poor Gehazi, did, too bad he didn't hear that one. Too bad he didn't take heed to that. Um, he goes down in Scripture as this just has been as we'll see in a minute. <coughs> the rich and poor meet together, the Lord is maker of them all. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Will thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches, riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. I love that verse. It's so true. I mean, it says that about money. It says that about riches. And isn't that the truth? You know, I get that bi-weekly paycheck and it's got that nice comma in it. You know, man, four figures, right? And it just seems like it, it just takes wings. And it just immediately, as soon as it comes in, it just goes right back out. And that's just the way life works. So if we set our, our eyes on that which is not, you know, and we labor to be rich, then, then uh, you know, just be, expect disappointment, expect a fall, expect to just see that money come in and go out. And what will you have in the end? Remove from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of the God my God in vain. Now, Matthew chapter 6, if you're there, look at verse 9. We're talking about, is it a time to receive? Is it a time for us, that during, considering the, the time that we live in, to begin to amass wealth? Is that the goal of our life? That we would begin to have riches on this earth? And to be a Gehazi, to pursue after the silver, to forsake the man of God, to lie to the man of God, to try and hide that, to bestow it in the house and save it up for a rainy day? Is that, is, that the, is that the motive in our life? To doubt the provision of God? And if we, if we doubt the provision of God, His ability to provide for us throughout our whole life, we're going to end up seeking after, after earthly riches. And we're going to rob ourselves of the true riches which are in heaven. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus warned of this. Matthew 6, 19, Lay not up yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Why? Why is that important? He tells us why. He doesn't just end it there and say, you know what, just do this, just trust me. He explains why. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And that's the problem with it. When your heart is, goes after the earthly riches, that's what it's going to be about. And you're, you're going to grow cold to the things of God. 
You're going to grow cold to the soul winning. You're going to grow cold to the reading of the Word of God, to understanding and knowing the Word of God. You're going to go cold to seeking after the benefit of others. And you're going to seek only the benefit of yourself. Because that's where your heart will be. But if your heart is set upon heavenly things, about storing up earthly treasures, obviously, you know, we can't send a check to heaven. We can't write, you know, hey, you know, to the, you know, write this out to Jesus Christ, you know, from Corbin Russell, X amount of dollars, and put it in the mail. It's just not going to make it, you know. He's talking about if, we're, if we really want to store up treasures in heaven, there's a way to do it. And it's through doing good works that we can lay up in store against the wrath, uh, against the wrath of the time to come. That's how we lay up treasures in heaven. It's through caring for others, for doing good deeds for others, for you know, tithing even, which is just a commandment, something you should be doing. But even you consider that tithes and offering, giving to the work of God. You know, there that that is fruit that will that will bound to your account. That God will see. Hey, you know. Maybe you weren't over to get over the Jamaican's mission trip, but you bought somebody else a plane ticket who could. But you got somebody else over there. You know, you're a father, you're a busy man, you're providing for a family, you, you don't have that much vacation time, you can't just take time off and fly to some foreign country and do, you know, be part of a great soul winning marathon. But over here there's this, you know, maybe like this poorer guy, this single guy who, he, who, who wants to go but can't afford to go, has the time, doesn't have the responsibility of a family to take care of. Maybe that guy could write the check out and say, hey, why don't you go in my stead? And everything that that young man or whoever what might be that goes over there and accomplishes that great work for him, that would be fruit abounding to his account. That would be a way to store up treasures for heaven. That's just a, you know, a practical example. But there's many ways that we can store up treasures in heaven. The point is, that's what we want to do. We want to store up treasures in heaven and not upon this earth because that will determine where our heart is. Matthew 13, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured, and, and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. Verse 22, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word, and the care of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So this, he gives this parable and explains it. And he, that the, specifically, regarding the seed that falls among, stone, among, the, uh, among the thorns. What's interesting is about the seed that falls among the thorns, is it tells us a couple things. One, that the problem is never with the seed. Wherever the seed falls, it, it germinates. It works. The word of God of course, is that seed. If we were to look deeper into this parable, we would see that the seed, the, the seed there is referring to the Word of God. The Word of God has power, is quick, it is powerful, and sharper than two, any, uh, any, any two-edged sword, dividing even the piercing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. So we know that the Word of God works. It's never without power. It's like that seed. Wherever that seed falls, whether it be on the stony places, whether it be on the wayside, whether it be among the thorns, it takes root and begins to grow. But it's the soil that determines how well it flourishes. It's the heart in which it's sown that determines whether or not it brings forth any fruit. And the seed here that fells among the thorns, it's interesting to note about that soil, that there is not a problem with the soil. With the stony places, the problem was that it had all that stone. Or the wayside that was just hard packed, it couldn't get that deepness of root. It was bad soil, it was a bad place to sow seed. But the, but the thorns... The thorny ground, obviously that soil must have been good, must have been good because it was growing thorns. That's, that's good soil. It was, support, it was already supporting life. It was already allowing thorns to flourish. It was good soil. It was good seed. The problem was the thorns that were there. The care of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. You see, there's plenty of people, there's plenty of Christians, I believe, that could be very fruitful. They could accomplish great things for God that could do great works, that they have a, in some degree, they have, a, they have a good heart. They want to see God glorified. But they will never do so because the thorns are there. The cares of this world, the riches of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, choke that word out in their heart and they become unfruitful. See, Gehazi was not a wicked guy. Gehazi was not some worshiper of Baal. He was not some 
you know, reprobate that, that was just tag. He wasn't some Judas in the crowd. I don't believe. I honestly, I believe he probably would have preceded Elisha had things gone differently for him. But there was that root of bitterness. There, there was that care, the deceitfulness of riches got to him. And he turned aside for filthy lucre. And he probably would have been a compromiser if he hadn't get, get, been struck down with leprosy. You see, plenty of people can be fruitful, but they just never will be. Eventually, they're just going to get choked out by those thorns. And if that's us today, we need, to get, you know, we need to get the garden hoe out. We need to get the shears out. We need to put on some gardening gloves and get out there and get, roll up the sleeves and start working in our lives to pull those thorns out so that the Word of God, so that that seed that's been sown in our hearts can flourish and not be choked out and bring forth much fruit. You know, maybe we need to weed out that Saturday afternoon that we would, you know, want to work those extra hours that we're not required to and say, that's giving me my soul many time. Or maybe we need to just, you know, pull out the, the weeds of saying, you know, I can't give like I want to give because I got to make sure that I have, you know, six to nine months of, of savings in the bank at all times. <coughs> Maybe there's maybe we could we could scale back something else. We gotta pull out some of those roots of the deceitfulness of riches in our life so that our the seed that's been sown can flourish. Because if we don't, because if we don't do those things, and if people continue to just let the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches deceitfulness of riches choke out the word in their life, they're gonna end up like a, a Gehazi spiritually. If we would turn back to 2 Kings chapter 8, and we'll end there. 2 Kings chapter 8. If we don't get the root of the deceitfulness of riches out of our life, we're going to end up like a spiritual Gehazi. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 8. Then spake Elisha unto the woman, whose son he had restored unto life, saying, Arise up thou and thine household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land seven years. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household and soldiered in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass, now this is after, of course, you know, Gehazi has been struck with leprosy and he went away, white as snow, right? And it came to pass at the seven years' end that the woman returned to the land of the Philistines and she went forth to cry to the king for her house and for her land. And look who's there. Look who's there with the king, right? And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha hath done. Past tense. Not all the great things that Elijah has done. You see, if we allow ourselves to become a spiritual Gehazi and just covet things and become more concerned with the riches of this world, we're going we're gonna to end up living in the past like Gehazi, talking about all the great things that Elisha, that somebody else hath done. People that can start out very well can finish poorly, if at all, like a Gehazi. And they end up just living in the glory, they're just rehearsing the glory days because they've fallen off spiritually. He said, tell me all the great things that Elisha hath done. Verse 5. And it came to pass when he was telling the king how he had restored a dead body to life. Saying, telling the king how about that miracle that we read about earlier where Elisha raised that boy back to life for the Shumanite woman. He's telling about somebody else's great exploits. They have no miracle. We'll end up with no miracles of our own. We won't be able to tell about the, you know, if we if we become a spiritual Gehazi and allow the deceitfulness of riches and the cares of this life to choke us out spiritually, we'll never have that fruit. We'll never be able to sit down with somebody and say, "Let me tell you about this great experience I had out soul winning. Let me tell you about what what our church is doing." We'll never have that great story to tell about all the great things that God is doing. We'll be living in the past and living through somebody else's experiences. We'll never have any miracles of our own. We'll end up living vicariously through others. We'll just end up watching the services online and not attending. There are church win souls, right? And what a shame it would be to be in Faithful Word Baptist Church or any other great soul winning church and to be sitting in that church week in and week out and allow the riches of this world to choke you out to the point where you're not even winning souls, where you're sitting in a church like that and you don't go soul winning. Where you're sitting in a great church like that and you're seeing all these great things being done for God and you've never seen it done for yourself. You never have a part in it. In one way or another, you end up just living vicariously through others. Their churches will win souls, but they will not. 
They'll watch others be blessed. Look at verse 6. And when the king had asked the woman, so the woman comes and Elisha, or, uh, Gehazi says, Hey, this is the woman I was just telling you about, whose son Elisha raised to life. And she's coming back to the king to restore the, the, the lands that she had lost when she obeyed the man of God and went to the land of the Philistines during the time of the famine. And verse 6, And when the king asked the woman, she told him, so the king appointed to her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field since the day she left the land, even until now. He says, Give everything back that was hers, and anything that, that anybody harvested, all the, the equivalent of anything that might have grown, give her that as well. So she didn't miss a beat. She didn't miss out, like maybe she was growing beets, but she literally did not miss out on any of the fruit of her land. She got everything. Even those, even the stuff that, that she missed out on during the seven years she wasn't there, he said, on all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. So she comes back and she gets everything back and everything that she missed out on. And what, what's Gehazi doing? Just sitting there watching it happen. When Christ comes to reward his servants, there will be many people that are only going to gaze on the sight like Gehazi. They're going to see people rewarded for great things. You know, I believe there's men, there's men in this church that could go out and be pastors. You know, they could go out and they could start churches that, that we desperately need. And they could go out and they could do a great work for God. And they could win that crown of glory that was reserved only for pastors. There's certain, a the crown that only a pastor will receive is that crown of glory. And they, and they could go out and do that. But they might pull a Gehazi. And they'll be more concerned with the riches of this world and the cares of this life. And that will get choked out in their life. And they'll never have that fruit. And one day when Christ returns, those men that made the sacrifices that maybe they weren't able to take the vacations, maybe they weren't able to have that hobby, maybe weren't able to live in the nice house and do all the things that they made those sacrifices, they were willing to go out and land the Philistines and suffer some loss by faith, they're going to be rewarded and they're going to be restored tenfold for their labors. And those men that could have had it, like a Ahazi, they're just going to sit there and watch it happen. And they're going to realize how robbed they were. Turn to 2 Kings chapter 4. I want to look at one more thing about the Shumanite woman because she's a very good example of what we need to be. You know, we don't want to be like Gehazi when they're just coveted and went after it, earthly riches. The Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 8, And it fell on a day that Elijah passed to Shunem, and there where was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And it was so that as often as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passeth by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall, and let us set for him a little bed, and a table, and a stool, and a candlestick. And it shall be when he cometh to us that he shall turn in thither. So she's giving him this place where he can you know, take a break from his journeys. And she's feeding him, and she's making a little guest chamber for him. You see, this Shu and I woman, she was unselfish. She was one that was willing to give. She wasn't going to him saying, hey, what can I get out of the situation? She wasn't a Gehazi who just wanted to see what he could get from the man of God. Let me hang around the man of God and maybe there'll be an opportunity for me to get some, some silver, some gold, some raiment. No, the Shumanite woman, she was willing to give. She was one that was willing to sacrifice. And in turn, she was, she was provided for. She was, she was given something. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 13. And he said unto him, Behold now, say, say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is to be done for thee? So Elijah's saying, Hey, you know, you've been treating us very well. What can I do for you? How can I return the favor? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king or to the captain of the host? And she answered, I dwell among my own people. See, she had this opportunity to receive. She had this opportunity to, take some, to get something back. And I don't believe that she started out, you know, giving the bread and making the chamber so that she could see what she could get out of it. She was just saying, Hey, this is a man of God. Let's, let's do him some, some honor. Let's be good to this man. So she used, and she's, so finally she gets this opportunity to receive something in return. And what does she do? She doesn't ask for riches. She's like, you know, like, it reminds me of like when King Solomon, when God came to him and said, hey, what will that I do that I should do for thee? Do you want riches? Do you want honor? Do you want all this? He said, no, I just want wisdom so that I can help your people and lead your people. He was unselfish, just like she is here. She uses this un, un opportunity to receive something and to be even further unselfish. And he said, What is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily she hath no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he called her, she stood in the door. And he said, About this season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. 
And she said, Nay, my lord, thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. And the woman conceived, and bare a son at that season, at that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. So she uses this opportunity to get something to the man of God, to do something very unselfish by bringing another child in this world. And that's a very unselfish act. For a woman to, to, to desire to become pregnant to, and go through the great struggle of, of, of carrying a child in the room, going through the, the morning sickness and, the, and, the, and all the pains and all the possible trauma that can happen to her body, and to go through all that discomfort, and then to go through childbirth itself, and then take on the duty and the responsibilities of raising that child, and all the hard work that goes into it. This is a very unselfish woman, this Shumanite woman. And her act... And her one act preserved her life and her inheritance. And she was willing to even go out and, and, and obey the man of God. And she preserved her own life. And when she came back, she even got all of her inheritance. What an unselfish woman. Because of her attitude, she was able to receive that child that she longed for. And she was able to see her, her, her lands restored and the fruit in a time of famine. And it, it preserved her. Because she was trusting in the provision of God. Unlike Gehazi. Now what did he get? What did Gehazi end up with at the end? He got some old stories and leprosy. White as snow. The Bible says, A little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of the many wicked. We ought to be careful and not allow ourselves to think that we're missing out on something. That we, when we see the riches of this world, and the people enjoying all these things. You know, the, my perfect example for me is bow hunting. I really want to, I mean, I'm living in Arizona, one of the best states for big game hunting. More record get big game animals are taken out of Arizona than anywhere else in the world. Right? And there's a big outdoor community here. And it'd be really easy for me to say, you know what, I'm just going to get comfortable here. I'm just going to get really comfortable here in Phoenix and, and work hard. And, and I'm just going to do some bow hunting. I'm just going to become a mighty hunter before the Lord. Right? <laughs> Probably become a complete failure. And I know that's not in the card screen. That's not, because that's not what God wants. That's not what we need. That, that, is not, that is not the time for this. It is not a time to receive trophy of, you know, of mounts. It's not the time for that. And I don't know that there will ever be a time for that. To make that the focus, not to let the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke that in my life. So we ought to be careful and not allow that to happen in our lives like Gehazi. By seeking our own gain. What can we do? Well, how can we enjoy the, the pleasures of this world? It will, it will rob us of our true rewards in heaven. You know, that, that, that we are going to, uh, we could potentially inherit one day in heaven. The great riches, the eternal riches. Where moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves not break forth nor steal. We need to be selfless like that Shumanite woman. And, and if we do that, if we seek the glory of God, if we seek the benefit of others, if we seek to please God with our lives and to serve Him and to live a humble and meager existence, you know, financially speaking, <coughs> it might be that I have to go live in a ghetto to serve God somewhere someday in a very meager home, in a rough neighborhood. But if doing that will bring other people to Christ, it may be that I never get to draw back on a 6x6 six six in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the pines of Arizona. But if I can go out and to do a great work for God. I mean, do you think in heaven when I'm receiving that crown of glory, or any pastor, if you know if that's the, if that's how it plays out for me, or any man of God who's made those sacrifices in his life, or even any just a, you know any person who's going to be rewarded, be crowned in heaven by Jesus Christ? Do you think I, if that were to happen, do you think I'm going to think back and go, "This is nice," but man, I really would have liked to have gotten some of that help me. Man, friend, that won't even be that won't even enter my mind for a second. We need to be selfless like that Shumanite woman. And God will bless us here and in heaven. We need to trust Him for provision. Not be in the gaze. I don't worry about that silver. Don't worry about name and silver. God can provide for you. And let's not worry about that. And let's seek the benefit of others. And let's see God bless us and provide for us in this life as we do that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the preaching of it. Lord, I pray that you would uh, help us to always be mindful, Lord, of uh, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, if we see these things springing up in our heart and our life, help us to be too quick to, to root it out and get it out of our lives. Help us to have the right priorities in, in serving you and, and, and understanding, Lord, that we have this one life to accomplish what we're going to accomplish for you. We have this one life to be rewarded for in glory. And Father, I pray you help us to just 
to, to serve every moment of our life. Just serve, spend every moment of our life just serving you. Or it's to the benefit of others. Not seeking our own gain. Not seeking what we can get out of it. Lord, not worrying about whether or not you can provide for us. But Lord, to just trust by simple faith that you are able to, to take care of us, Lord. That we are of more value than many sparrows. Lord, and, and you take care of all of them, Lord. You, the Bible says that, that uh, you know, you, you clothe the grass, which, to, and, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the hub, into the oven. And Father, how much more will you not care for us, Lord, and clothe us and give us those things that we need? Help us to never to be worried about that or to be deceived into following after or vain riches, to fall into that temptation and the snare. But help us to serve you, Lord. Help us to be humble. Help us to seek... Lord, your glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.